All right. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good spring break. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, what you can see displayed on the screen are the results for both exam one and two. Everything in blue is exam one. Everything in orange is exam two. On the left side is a chart of the letter grades, A, B, C, D, and F for both exams. So you can see that uh, we have the same number of A's on both exams. And on the second exam, the number of B's went up. Um, the number of C's went down. The number of D's went up one. And the number of F's went down one. Um, the class average on the second exam was a 77.8. Um, the first exam, it was a 75. And you can see here that um, the way this chart works over here is it's the same, the same student. So for example, the student who scored a 96 on this exam, the highest score on this exam, um, got an 86.7 on the first exam. So you can kind of see like if a student improved or you know did better or did worse. We did have people who their scores came up quite a bit. Um, these two, in fact, went from low grades on first exam to A's. But then we also had the reverse. We had students that went from B's down to D's and F's. And so it's kind of kind of was a mixed bag. Um, overall, I thought that the results were good. Um, but I also think that the test was was easy. Um, I, you know, I, I don't mean that to be like rude. I just think that that was a very straightforward exam. Um, it was very much like the review. So yeah, I was expecting to, to probably have an average close to a B um, on the test. So yeah, that's where we are. Any questions on, on that? I have not added any bonus, you know, for like having your videos on and all that. I'm going to do that at the end of the semester. So, you know, just keep that in mind, but that will, that will come into play at some point. I apologize about uh, the dog. Um, if you can hear it, sorry. All right. Well, that's, that's all I've got to say about that exam. Any, any questions? You already said no, but anything you want to talk about? Okay, well, maybe you remember what we were doing before we took a test. We had started talking about related rates, chapter two, section seven. And as far as our schedule is concerned, you know, what we did is we had moved exam two down to right before spring break. And we are, we are now gonna be doing, uh, today's the 22nd, we're gonna be doing 2.7. Probably gonna take two days for this section. Um, and then, I'm gonna probably condense 3.1 and 3.2 and 3.3 into one day, which I already told you 3.1 and 3.2 is a review of college algebra stuff. So I should be able to kind of knock that out as we go. The important stuff is really in 3.3 where we talk about derivatives of expon exponentials and logs. So that's the plan. Hopefully we'll be back on track here in the next two weeks. So today's notes, or today, the plan for today is related rates. Next time, also related rates. And I'll remind you that on our um, Canvas website, there's a file there where I give you like a worksheet. It's called the related rates worksheet. This is something that you can use. If you print out a few of these, you can use these on the exam. Um, but it's just something that helps us kind of put these word problems together in a, in a some sort of format that makes sense. And so today my, my task, my goal is to try and do one, two, three, four, five, six examples. I'm, I'm, that's pretty ambitious, but I'm gonna try and do six word problems. And I think what you need to do is kind of sit there and just kind of let this soak in. You know, after one example, you still may be kind of lost. Hopefully by the time we get to the end of today, you'll get, you'll have like a better feel for how to approach these things. The challenge is really that, that all of these problems are uniquely different, right? So I can show you a hundred 
related rate problems and then hand you another one that, that's different. So it's not like product rule, chain rule, quotient rule, where once you understand the method, you kind of like, there's nothing else, right? It's chain rules, chain rule, product rules, product rule, quotient. These are word problems. So every everything is, is really hinged on whether or not you can translate the word problem into the math, all right? So the, the strategy, this is the strategy that I have written down in our, in our lecture notes, which you can find on Canvas. Um, this, is, this is kind of the template that we use, but I just wanna make sure you understand that this is not, it isn't always gonna go this way. Like things are not always gonna work out exactly the way steps one through six work here. So with all of these problems, we wanna try and, and draw pictures, okay? Whoa, why is it doing that? That's weird. Whoa, what? Y'all see that? That's strange. Let me close this program and reopen it. That's acting strange. Okay, that's better. All right, so we always, what, what's happening, and, and I know it's been spring break and you had a test before this. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take some physical situation where things are in motion and we're trying to relate the rate that one variable is changing and how that impacts <clears throat> the rate at which another variable is changing. So the first example that I gave you all was, was a, um, a circle that was growing. And we said, oh, if the radius is growing at a certain <clears throat> fixed rate, how fast is the area growing? We were trying to relate those rates together. So you're always going to be given some physical situation <clears throat> where things are changing and then asked to find how fast something is changing at an exact moment in time. So we're gonna to wanna to draw two pictures. The first picture is gonna be a picture of the exact moment in time. And then the other picture is gonna be <clears throat> what I call the general picture. And in the general picture, we have to treat that general picture like things are in motion. So you have one picture where things are fixed and one thing where things are, are moving. So you'll do that. <clears throat> you'll assign variables. I apologize, I'm getting over something. <clears throat> You're going to assign any variables, um, any constants. We're going to be we're going to be labeling our pictures, um, and then we want to write down. Really important. We want to write down what we're given and what we want. Okay, this is a big key to the problem. You have to you have to be able to translate the word problem and say, okay, what do I what am I what am I given here? And what is it that I'm looking for? And then once you do that, then we'll follow through with the rest of it, which is to find an equation and then do differentiation and then plug and chug it after that. So I'm only focusing right now on these first three steps because you know, can't go anywhere without those. You have to have that down first. So let's proceed to the first uh, problem here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got some chloroseptic here. My throat is real itchy today. I don't know. Allergies, maybe. Um, all right. So we're going to, I'm just going to show you first the problem, the way it would be presented to you on a test. Okay. If the radius of a sphere is increasing at a constant rate of two feet per second, how fast is the volume increasing when the volume is 36 pi cubic feet? Um, I looked in my notes. I do not believe we've done this problem. Someone please double check. I do not believe we did this. Yeah, we did not. We did circle stuff. Yeah, we did circles. So we have a sphere, right? And this sphere is growing, right? The radius of the sphere is increasing, right? Keywords here, increasing. What's increasing? The radius. The radius of what? A sphere. So we have to start to visualize the sphere that's growing where the radius is increasing at a constant rate, right? The radius is increasing at the constant rate of two feet per second, all right? So you got that visualization. Think of a balloon, right? It's like a balloon that's being blown, you know, blowing up a balloon. It's a perfect sphere and the radius keeps growing at a certain constant rate. Then comes the question, how fast is its volume increasing when the volume is 36 pi cubic feet, okay? So let's, let's, get, let's get a picture going here. I'm gonna copy uh, that template here. I'm gonna make this smaller. 
see if I can squeeze that in right here. Good enough. Okay, so I'm first going to draw a picture, the instant picture, all right, which is going to be the picture that represents the exact moment in time that I'm being asked about. So I'm being asked how fast is the volume increasing when the volume is 36 pi cubic feet. So I'm gonna draw a sphere. And, and the easiest way to draw a sphere is to draw a circle and then to draw like almost like a little ellipse. Oh, yeah, kind of like an ellipse like this. And it kind of looks three-dimensional that way, right? It has a center. And the only thing I can tell you is that at the moment in time we're talking about, the volume is fixed, right? The volume here is 36 pi cubic feet, right? So imagine that thing, it's sitting there, it's got a fixed volume, right? That's it, that's the general picture. I don't have anything else. Now, let me ask you something though. In this picture, this sphere has a radius, doesn't it? Would that radius be a number that you could find right now? Could you tell me what the radius of that sphere is? If I tell you that the volume is 36 pi cubic feet, could you? You should be able to because you have, we have a formula that relates volume to radius. You would have to go back to your formula sheets. Let's go grab it real quick if you didn't know it. Here it is for sphere. I'll just copy this here. For sphere. Is there a question? No? Okay. So I'm just going to slap this in here. I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah, I don't think I can put it on top of that. Oh, yeah, they let me. <clears throat> so I, I have this, this formula here. Whoa, <clears throat> didn't want to do that. I have this formula for um a sphere and i have in here a relationship between volume and radius so if i know the volume is 36 pi i should be able to recover the radius so i'm just going to put a little check mark right here that kind of lets me know that if i need the radius i should be able to find it right but in that picture the radius is fixed now in the general picture I want to imagine that this sphere is growing, all right? So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So here the radius is not fixed, right? It's a variable. The radius is whatever the radius is, but it's not a fixed number because it keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, of course, if it's getting bigger, then the volume is also changing, isn't it? The volume increases as it gets bigger. So that's, that's kind of like, that's all I can do for the two pictures. Main thing is for you to understand the picture on the left is a snapshot in time. The picture on the right is moving, it's growing, right? It's, it's in motion. So what are we given? Well, I'm coming over here to this step. What am I given? Well, let's see. I'm given that the radius is increasing at a constant rate of two feet per second. So I'm given the rate at which the radius changes with respect to time. So when, anytime I'm given a rate, I need to be thinking derivative. So it's the, I'm, I'm given here the D, the change in radius with respect to time, dr dt is two feet per second. Does that make sense to everyone? I have assigned a value to the dr dt because I've, I'm given in the problem the rate at which the radius is changing. So I've assigned that now the value of two. Now, what, I'm, what I want in the problem, right? What I want is, is how fast the volume is increasing. How fast, that's a rate, okay? Wants to know, we wanna know the rate at which the volume is changing. So I wanna know dV, the change in volume with respect to time. I wanna know that. And I wanna know it at an exact moment at the moment that the volume is 36 pi cubic feet. So usually in these problems, when you're working them, the thing that you want 
is some derivative, d something dt or something like that. That's what you're looking for at a specific moment. And that moment is when the, when the actual um, sphere is fixed in time, the snapshot. Questions? In terms of steps, I've done. How, how, how would you in, like ask for the change in volume at a fixed volume? Is that what you said? Like yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you asked. So what I'm what I'm yeah what I'm asking is how fast is the volume changing at a specific moment in time, right? But it's not like we're gonna stop the the sphere from growing. Here here's the way. Here's a way I can um, kind of help you think about this. I don't know if y'all can see me on my camera, but if I'm running, right? If I'm running down the street and you're watching me run, right? If you take a picture of me, it's going to look like I'm frozen, right? But at that moment in time, I had a speed. Even though I'm frozen, like if I'm frozen, I'm not moving, right? But we know that it, I was moving. And at that instant, I wanted to know how fast I was going. So that's what's happening here. We're letting the sphere grow and then we're taking a picture of it. And when we took that picture, I wanted to know how fast the volume was growing at that moment. Because if I actually stop it, if I stop the sphere, right? That means if, it would be like me saying, you know, if I'm running and I stop running, okay, and I'm standing there and then I ask you, how fast am I going? Well, I'm not, I'm not moving anymore, right? That's not what we're doing here. We're allowing it to grow and never stopping it, but taking that snapshot and asking what happened, what was happening at that instant. Does that make more sense, Bellum? Thank you, yes. It's a great question because if, if something's not moving, then it's there's no rates of change of anything. So it's always in motion, all right? Okay, so now that we have what we're given and what we want, the next key to the to the um, steps here is to find an equation that somehow relates what you are given to what you want to find. And when I say an equation, I should have put here any equation. You need to come up with any equation that somehow connects what you're looking for to what you were given. And in, in terms of, of math, what that means is I'm, I'm looking for dr dt, I'm sorry, I'm looking for db dt, and I'm given dr dt. So I'm just going to focus on the variable r and v. Those two variables, radius of the sphere and volume of the sphere, I need to somehow connect the radius and volume together with any formula I, that, that exists out there. But we have it, right? I mean, this the, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. That is an equation that connects V and R together. So we should probably use that one, right? So I'm gonna now write that equation down right here in this box, volume equals four thirds pi r cubed. Now, the reason we want an equation that has both V and R in it Okay, the reason we want that is because now we can do implicit differentiation with respect to time. And what I know, what we've learned from chain rule is that if V appears in there and R appears in the equation, if we differentiate with respect to time, then we're gonna get a dV dt somewhere and we're gonna get a dr dt somewhere because we're differentiating with respect to a variable that's not the original variable, right? V and R are not T. So we're never gonna get a one in the chain rule. Remember, you only get a one when you go like DX, DX, or DY, DY, or DT, DT. But if you do DV, DT, or DR, DT, then that's what it is. It's, you know, that's, am I making sense? I know, so I don't know how good your spring break was. So, I, you know, I'm just trying to make sure you still remember this stuff. You know, all right, we have the equation. So implicit differentiation. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna go the derivative with respect to time on the left side equals the derivative with respect to time on the right side. And I'm differentiating with respect to time 
Why? Well, because that's what I'm looking for, right? I want to know the rate of change in radius with respect to time. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I want, I keep on saying that's what I want. I'm given the rate of change in, of radius with respect to time, and I want the change in volume with respect to time, so I should differentiate with respect to time. All right, left side. The derivative with respect to time of V would be? One. Uh, well, oh. dbdt dbdt yeah dbdt it would only be one that would only be one okay y'all y'all tell me when what's the only way the left side would be one that it was for your respect of the volume if it if we were doing d d v of v right or if we were doing d d t of t that so if that V was a T, then this would be a one, or if that T right there was a V, then this would be one. But if it's if these two variables are different, then that becomes just dV dt. And you should be like very happy now because dV dt appears now, doesn't it? Like here it is, it's right there. It's part of this equation. And, and guess what? That's what we're trying to find, right? So it better have appeared somewhere in our equation. And it has, so I'm happy about that. Now on the right side, I need to take derivative of all this. And it may look nasty, but isn't four thirds pi, isn't that all a constant? Four thirds is a constant, pi is a constant, multiply them together, it's a constant. So when you take a derivative and you have a constant attached to a function, it comes for the ride, right? So the, I'm gonna get the four thirds pi to come for the ride. Now times, now I'm ready to take the derivative of r cubed with respect to t. What's that? Would it be the r squared dr dt? It'll be three r squared. So you're using power rule there. Okay, so you're taking derivative of r cubed, which is three r squared, but then you have to say times, now chain rule, the derivative of the r itself with respect to t, which is your dr dt. And are we happy to see dr dt? Yeah, because it's given to us, right? We know that that's a two in the problem. We're done with the differentiation, right? We're done. I'm going to take that answer, right? I'm going to take that answer, maybe. I don't know if it's going to let me do this. No. Why wouldn't it let me select that? Oh, shit. Okay, that's all right. I'm going to take that answer, dv dt. This is my little scratch work section. Four thirds pi times three r squared times dr dt. And I'm gonna start inspecting this and figure out what it is that I know, what it is that I need to figure out. I mean, do I have enough to solve for, for what I need to solve for? So we're trying to find dv dt, right? That's what we're trying to look for, dv dt. Well, there's dvdt, so I'm gonna put a little check mark here. I'm happy to see this, right? Four thirds pi times three, now r. Do I know what r is? In this snapshot moment, do I know what r is? We can find it. Yeah, I don't know directly, but remember earlier I said, hey, look, I know that in the snapshot, in the instant we're talking, I was given the volume, I could find the, the radius if I needed it right? If I needed it, I could find it. Well, guess what? I'm going to need it, okay? So this right here, I'm going to put a question mark because we have to do some work to get it, all right? And the only other thing left here is drdt, but that I'm happy with because I know that that's two because that was given to me. So before I can proceed now, what I need to do is figure out what r is. So I'm going to do that right down here. Question is, what's r? But I'm given the volume at the instant time is 36, 36 pi cubic feet. And I also know that volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So if the volume is 36 pi, I can say 36 pi must equal 4 thirds pi r cubed and then solve this for, for r. Does this make sense? I'm just going back to the original volume formula. I know the volume is 36 pi. I set it equal to the, you know, to the four thirds pi r cubed, and then I'm gonna solve for r. So let's do this. Um, divide both sides by pi. 
it's gone, right? Divide both sides by pi. And then I'm gonna multiply both sides by three fourths. That's the reciprocal of four thirds. That'll, that'll kill off the fraction over there. And what is uh, <clears throat> three fourths times 36? How would you do that? I personally would do 36 divided by four first, reduce that, make that a nine. And then nine times three is 27. So I get 27 here equals R cubed. And then I would just take the cube root on both sides. So the radius is three. Questions? We're almost done. We'll come back up here and write everything. DV DT, that's what I'm looking for equals four thirds pi times three times, now the radius squared. Well, I just found that the radius was three. So three, let me, I'll do it in green. I found the radius was three. So uh, three squared, that's this part, right? And then I also know dr dt, um, that was two, wasn't it? And let's just clean it up. These threes cancel. Could have done that a long time ago. Uh, let me see. Three squared is nine. Nine times two. 18. 18 times four. It's 18 times four. Go with me today. It's 72. 72. Okay, 72. All right, 72. All right. Oh, uh, pi. Sorry, I got the pi. There it is 72 pi. Okay, so that right now, so far, that I mean, that's our answer, but this answer needs to be written, okay, with the correct units. So I'm going to come to my final solution DVDT equals 72 pi. Now, the way that I always look at the units is I just go, go to this ratio. It's volume over time, right? Volume is measured in what? Well, look at, look at our, our sphere was measured feet. in feet here. So volume would be cubic feet, right? Cubic feet. So I'm gonna put here cubic feet per Time, time in this problem was measured in seconds. So I'm gonna put per second, there it is. All right, that only took us half an hour. I went very slow though, because I really missed the first one, spring break. So you've got this sphere, it's growing so that its radius was increasing at a constant rate of two feet per second, growing, 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 right? At the instant, the volume was 36 pi cubic feet, right? At that instant, the volume was growing at that instant at 72 pi cubic feet per second. So that's kind of like if I was running and you took a picture of me, at that instant, you told me how fast I was running. We were saying how fast the volume was increasing. Questions? Take a minute to read that one. Are you reading that? I'm going to go grab, sorry, I'm going to go grab this. Sheet and put it in here for us. Okay, let's talk about this. 
Can somebody tell me what's, what's the same in this problem or what's different in this problem from the previous one? The volumes. Uh, yeah, the volume is the same. It's the same uh, static volume, the same instant. It's the same instant. Okay. And are they asking for the same thing? No. Oh, well, yes, yes. They're asking for the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, they are, right? They're saying, hey, look, because in the previous problem says, how fast is the volume increasing when the volume was 36 pi cubic feet? That's exactly the same question here. How fast is the volume increasing when the volume is 36 pi cubic feet? So it's the same sphere that's growing, right? It's the same instant in time. What's different though? Looking for the surface area. Well, the we're looking for the rate that the surface area is increasing. By. Are we are we looking for the rate that it's well? Uh, what's in green is what we're looking for, right? How fast is the volume increasing? Oh, we're given the we're given the rate at which the surface area is increasing. Exactly, and in the previous problem, we were given the rate that the what was increasing. Uh, the radius, I think. The radius. Okay, so in the previous problem, the sphere was growing so that the radius was increasing at a constant rate. This problem, it's not the radius that's increasing at a constant rate, it's the surface area that's increasing at a constant rate. Two completely different scenarios. Now, I have a visualization for this so you can kind of see the difference. Which one was this? Okay, here was the problem that we did that we just got an answer 72 pi cubic feet per second. This was it. It was a sphere that was growing and the radius was increasing at a constant rate, okay? That's what was happening before. I'll let it, I'll let it go through the cycle one more time. Just take a look at it. That's what's happening, right? And we were wanting to know at a specific instant how fast the volume was changing. Now what we're doing, is the surface area is growing at a constant rate. So the bigger a balloon gets, the more surface area, right? So what should happen here is in the beginning, it should go grow kind of fast, but then it's gonna to have to slow down because the more it grows, the more surface area it adds, and it has to hold that surface area to be growing constantly. Just watch. Fast and then watch. Now it's getting, it's slowing down. Can you all tell it's getting slower? The growth of that sphere is, is slower and slower and slower because it's got to maintain a constant uh, rate of change of surface area. So the radius can't grow at, this, at a constant rate. Okay, hopefully you understand that visually. Let's get down to how we do this. So. If the surface area of the sphere is increasing at a constant rate, oh, that's a big word for me, rate derivative, right? And 20 square feet per second. Let's, let's draw some pictures. So it's the same picture. I have at the instant in time, this thing. It has a radius, which I could figure out because I know the volume is 36 pi. Cubic feet. I'm moving fast because we just did the same setup on the previous problem. In general, the sphere is growing, right? And the radius is changing, but everything's in motion there. Who wants to tell me what I'm given? D what? D what? Uh, D A D T. Good. The change in surface area, the change in area, right? Surface area is given to me to be growing at a constant rate. And what is it? Uh, would it be four pi? Well, no, no, no. It's sorry, 20 feet squared per yeah, second. 20, yes. 20 square feet per second is the constant rate of change of the surface area. Good. Does everyone understand that? The yellow is telling me that. The surface area of the sphere is increasing at a constant rate. Rate tells me derivative. Here's the rate, 20 feet per square feet per second. 
What am I given? Or sorry, not what am I given? What do I want? Well, we already said this is the same question as last time, right? So we want D V D T, right? We want to know how fast the volume is changing with respect to time at the instant that the volume is 36 pi cubic feet, cubic feet, right? Any questions? What next? Sorry, so I just wanna like understand it. So for the what uh, you are giving, you put D and then A, that's for the surface area? Yes. Okay, so that's like what they give us. That's right, because they told us, right, if the surface area of the sphere is increasing at a constant rate of 20 square feet per second, so they've given us the rate at which the surface area is changing, right? With respect to time, they've given us that. And then they're asking how fast is the volume increasing, right? Okay. Got it? Yeah, okay, I got it. Thank you. Any other questions? What next? Equations, I guess. What equation, you need an equation. Um, what what variables do you need to tie together in this equation? Area and volume. Area and volume. Harry, any equation you can come up with that connects area and volume together. Not in, in, right in now. relation to a sphere, though, right? We have to be talking about a sphere here. What were, what were we saying, Robert? Uh, I'm not. I can't think of one, but yeah, I can think because, of individual ones. Yeah, these are the only two that were given, right? I'm gonna just write this, uh, let me do this on new page. Okay, these are the only two equations we're given for sphere, okay? It's the only two we have. We have one formula that has volume and, and radius connected, right? And we have another one that has area and radius connected, but we don't have anything that has volume and, and area connected, right? It'd be nice if we did, but we don't. So we have an issue here. We can't use these right now the way they are because they both have an R in them. And what's gonna happen if I differentiate one of these and I have an R in there? What's gonna happen? What's gonna pop out when I do differentiation if there's an R in there? DRDT, is that? A DRDT. Okay, now in what we are given and what we want, are we, do we know anything about DRDT? No, no, we know nothing about DRDT. So if we try and use these equations with an R in them, we're gonna have stuff in that equation that we know nothing about. Does that make sense, everyone? That's trouble. So how in the world are we gonna do it? Well, here's how, okay? It's actually, it's just gonna be some algebra, all right? So Can let me write the DRDT. Could we substitute it like in just the general formula? Say again? Like if we have dr dt, we can put it instead of r in the volume and area? No, no, no. Or no? If we had dr dt, right, then if we see, because remember, the, the steps say that what we're going to do is we're going to find an equation, then we're going to differentiate it, right? And we're going to differentiate it with respect to time because that's, you know, what we're given and what we want have to do with time, right, as the independent variable. And so if my equation has an R in it, then when I differentiate with respect to time, I'm going to get a dr dt mm -hmm. and I don't have any information. So I don't want an R in there. Mm -hmm. If I had dr dt, if I did, if they gave me dr dt, then I wouldn't be afraid to use the formula because I would have information about DRDT, but I don't. So what I'm gonna do is this. I have one equation that has V and R connected, right? Think about it. I have V is somehow connected to R, right? But that R is also connected to area through a different formula. So that means there must be some connection between the two, right? We have to establish what that connection is. And it's actually pretty simple. I'm not gonna say it's simple, simple idea, I'm just gonna take either one of these equations and solve them for R. 
So I'm gonna choose this one. I'm gonna take this and solve for R. You ready? Divide both sides by four pi. And then I'm gonna take the square root on both sides. Now, when I take the square root, I'm only supposed to do, I'm actually supposed to do plus or minus, right? Because I took the square root. I'm not gonna do negative because radius, well, the radius is a distance from the center of the sphere to the edge, and that should be a positive number. It shouldn't be negative. So I'm just ignoring the negative answer because it's within the framework of a geometrical like situation. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's what R is, right? Well, now what I can do is I can take this formula and rewrite it, V equals 4 thirds pi. Now R, I know what R is, right? R is, it's supposed to be R cubed right there, right? It's R cubed. Well, this is what R is in, in, in terms of, of um, A. It's the square root of A over four pi. Now, you may not like that, but that's, that is true, isn't it? Like if this is the relationship between A and R, and I can solve it for R and then take that and plug it in here. Then now, don't I have an equation now that has B and A and there's no R's in here? So if I differentiate that with respect to time, I'm going to get a dV dt somewhere, right? And I'm going to get a dA dt somewhere. And I'm happy about that because, well, dA dt I'm given and dV dt I'm looking for. But differentiating that is probably going to suck, isn't it? Okay, so before I do anything else, I'm going to clean it up, all right? Just follow along here. I'm going to rewrite this as, instead of the square root of all this, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do a over 4 pi to the half. Isn't that what the square root really means? Right? but then all of that is still cubed. And the reason I did that is because we now have something to a power to a power. And so you can multiply those two powers together and get four thirds pi. And then you have a over four pi <coughs> to the three halves. <laughs> Y'all still there? I'm gonna do one more thing before we move back to our, to our other page. I'm gonna rewrite the inside as one over four pi times a to the three halves. It's kind of, it's kind of like, the reason I did that is, is, is for this reason. Let's say I had like x over four. Right? You could rewrite that as one fourth x. That's the same thing, right? And, and I prefer that because when it comes to taking derivatives, I'd rather take the derivative of that than to think of it as like a quotient rule or something. I just, I'd rather look at it as a one fourth in front, a constant in front of the function, as opposed to some weird quotient rule. All right. There's our equation. That is an equation that relates V and A together. So I'm ready to go back and write it down. So my equation is volume equals four thirds pi and one over four pi times A raised to the three halves. Just double check that, that's what we had, right? All right, differentiate with respect to time. Take the derivative with respect to time on the left. The derivative with respect to time on the right.
All right, the left side's the easy part, right? I hope the derivative of V with respect to T is dV dt. Happy to see that, right? Happy to see that. That's actually what I'm trying to find, right? I want that. I want to see what dV dt is. All right, now the rest of this, this is going to be pretty, pretty nasty. Be careful with this. I'm taking derivative of all this crap. Do you all agree that four pi over three is a constant? So it can just come for the ride. Four thirds pi comes for the ride. Now, I'm focusing all my attention on taking the derivative of everything in yellow now. That is going to be chain rule, right? So if you take derivative of this, what happens first? Uh, if you do the move the three over the the exponent the yeah the three halves comes out to the front. front and then we have all of this don't touch it right do not touch the inside yet raise it to what power one half a half right we have to subtract one from that power one half now you can continue inside now you have to take the derivative of what's in there. Well, one over four pi is a constant, right? So it comes for the ride. And then you have to say times. Now, what's the derivative of A? DA dt. DA dt. Everyone got that? It's not one. Of course, we're differentiating with respect to t. So that's DA dt. We are done. We are done. We have the derivative. You didn't realize it's gonna be this fun, right? This is this is normally the least favorite topic in Cal One. From if I take a poll of Cal Two students, this is their least favorite topic. But it's probably the most like applicable one. You know, like real world, take a real world problem, turn it into the math, do the calculus. Okay. Woo. All right, that looks pretty bad. Um, let me just do a little quick check marks to say like whether or not I'm happy or not. So dBdt, I'm happy about that because that's what I'm looking for. DADT back here, I'm happy to see that because that's actually given to me in the problem. That's 20. The only other thing that I don't quite know here is A. I don't know the area of this thing at that instant in time, do I? Not, not explicitly, what am, what, am I, what am I given though? At the moment in time we're talking about, I'm given the volume, aren't I? Aren't I given the volume? Well, guess what? If you know the volume of a sphere, then you, you gotta be able, you then must be able to tell me what the area is, right? Just like when you knew the volume of the sphere, you knew what the radius was, you, can't, you could go find it, couldn't you? So if you know the, the volume, you should be able to tell me the area. Well, how are we gonna do that? So I, I'm gonna put a little question mark here because this is the one thing we don't know. Everything else we're happy about, right? How are we gonna figure out the area if we have the volume? Where would we get that from? Well, wait a minute, hold use on. Use the equation. Yeah, can't we just use this equation right here? Can we just use this? This has volume and area together before we differentiated it, right? Let's go back to this. And now let's replace this V with 36 pi. And if we do that, we have an equation that just has one letter in it, A, right? Well, yeah, pi is a letter, but it represents a number, right? So, so we should be able to solve this. Uh, divide both sides by pi, solve for A. Um, multiply both sides by three fourths to kill off this fraction. We've done this already. Wasn't this? Uh, 27. 27, yeah. So we know the left side of this is 27 equals, okay, one over four pi A to the three halves. Okay, that power is an issue. That three halves power is an issue. So how do I get rid of that power? 
I will raise both sides to what power? How about the two thirds? What would happen if I raised it to the reciprocal power? You multiply these two together and what do you get? One. One, right? Which basically kills it off. So that would leave me with a one over four pi A, okay? Over here, I no longer have a power because I killed it off. Over here, I've got to figure out what 27 to the two thirds is. So what is 27 to the two thirds really mean? It means the cube root of 27 squared. This is properties of exponents, college algebra. The denominator is the root. The two is the numerator is the power. So what's the cube root of 27? Three. What number times itself three times gives you 27? Three. Three, right? So this is three squared. So that's really just nine. So the left side of this is really just nine. I'm almost there. Multiply both sides by four pi. You get 36 pi is your area. Wow. Questions? Let me come back here now. I'm ready to write everything down. DVDT is the thing I was looking for, equals four thirds pi times three halves. I'm just writing all this down in parentheses, one over four pi times the area, right? The area. What did we just find the area to be? 36 pi. 36 pi. So I'm put 36 pi here. All of that raised to the half, all of that times one over four pi times dA dt, which was given to me in the problem to be 20. Just remember this, that, right? This 20 that was given, that was right up here. All right, cleanup time. I think there's a lot of good things that happen here. Let's see, these, these threes go away. That two goes into two once and into here twice. Um, check out inside the parentheses, the pies go away and the 36 over four, that becomes a nine. That's a nine. What is nine raised to the half? Isn't that square root of nine? Isn't that what that means? So isn't Great. just all of that right there, just three? And then up here, what was all of that? I think just two pi, right? Two pi times three times, let's see, four goes into four once, four goes in 25 times. So I just have a five over pi there. These pies go away. We're there. Six times 530 is my answer. DV DT is equal to 30. And now I need to put the units. Volume over time. Our units here are in feet. So the volume is measured in cubic feet. And time here is measured in seconds. Do y'all see all I'm doing is I'm saying, oh, volume is cubic feet and time is in seconds. Do y'all see it? That's how I'm coming up with the units there. <laughs> All right, that one took us about 25 minutes. So there was a lot of weird stuff happening here. The picture, the pictures were actually pretty easy. What we're given and what we want were pretty clear. The hard part was coming up with the equation, connecting the two variables together, and then cleaning it up and differentiating it, not making a mistake with the derivative, right? And then even after we got the derivative, we didn't know what A was. So then we had to go back and get A off of that formula that we had created. And then it's just plug and chug, and then just get your units correct. 
All right. So I think I may have told you all this story about when I was in graduate school, I had to do these um, calculus recitations on Fridays where I'd go in and students would ask questions. I tell you all a little bit about that. No. If I didn't, don't worry about it. In grad school, that was one of my duties. Um, I worked for the college. So every Friday, I'd, I would go into an auditorium with about 100 calculus students, and they could ask me questions from their homework. And man, you talk about like feeling nervous, having a, a class of calculus students asking you related rate problems and feeling confident enough that you can do them right, like no matter which one they give you. That's that's when I knew like I felt good about it, you know, because th these are scary problems because each one of them are so different. You don't know you don't know the path you're going to go down. You know, it's just like you don't know where this thing's going to lead you. But you just have to be confident in the math. OK, here we needed to connect V and A together, figured out a way to do it. We did it. We grind it out, you know, trust the algebra. All right. Moving on. All right, this is a classic example. Like every Cal One student sees this problem. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to think about it. And why don't I give you, I don't know, five minutes just to see how how much of this table you can put together, this this cheat sheet thing. Do as much as you can with that in the next five minutes. It's different, it's not a sphere, okay? So all bets are off, no more sphere stuff. It's completely different geometry now. While you're thinking about it, would you like to see an animation of it or do you wanna just go without the animation? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, no. It may be hard to tell here, but notice that the top of the ladder is coming down the wall at a constant rate. So this, this dot like on the y-axis here is moving down at a constant rate. But notice the, the dot, the bottom of the ladder, this piece here, notice it moves away from the wall very quickly initially, and then it slows down. See, watch how fast in the beginning. Do y'all see that? A lot of students think, oh, well, if this end is coming down at a constant rate, then this end must also move away at a constant rate, but that's not the case. Can you all tell from that picture or from that animation? This dot's coming down at a constant rate. This dot's moving to the right, but it's getting slower as it moves to the right. Okay. Give you a few more minutes. See what you can put together.
30 more seconds. All right, y'all ready? Now, I showed you the animation, but um, if I were doing this problem, I probably would draw it differently. I probably would put my wall over here in the ground like this. That I mean, and it doesn't matter which way you draw it, okay? So do y'all want me to do it this way or you want me to switch it to more like the animation? Do you care? It's, it's fine. the same thing. It's the same thing. So I'm drawing the exact moment in time. And you know what? I think I might draw the general picture first. Nothing's, nothing's telling, nothing. There's nothing written in stone that you have to do one of these things before the other, okay? This is a template of how to go about these problems. I'm gonna just draw a ladder over here. And I'm gonna make sure that I label it 20 feet because that ladder's length never changes, right? No matter what, that's fixed throughout the entire situation. So what I know is that when this ladder is moving, this point's moving down, and this point is moving this way, right? I'm just trying to draw some arrows to kind of show the motion a little bit. Now, at the instant in time we're talking about, it says the, 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 the ladder slides on the wall such that the top of the ladder um, is moving down at a constant rate of 0.5 feet per second. I think I'm going to label that. This is 0.5 feet per second. I'm just doing this to help me kind of visualize what's going on. This point is coming down the wall at half a foot a second, right? And at the moment, the top of the ladder is three feet from the ground. Okay, I think I can put that into my instant picture. I have my 20 foot ladder here. This point is three feet from the ground here. And then this point's over here. That's the instant in time, isn't it? That's the exact snapshot picture. Also, this is 20 because the, the ladder's not shrinking or growing, right? Wait a minute, if, if I have both those sides, could I figure out the distance from here to here if I needed it later? Yeah. I could, could right? Use Pythagorean theorem? Yeah, you could use Pythagorean. We may or may not need it, okay? We may or may not. I, I'm just thinking kind of, kind of thinking out loud here. I'm like, oh, well, that's a right triangle and I, I should be able to find that side if I need it later. Okay. Um, man, am I missing anything? At the moment, top ladder is three feet. How fast, how fast is the bottom of the ladder moving away from the wall? So I want to know, don't I want to know this right here? How fast this point's moving? I want to know that, don't I? Hmm. So what am I given? I, I, I'm confused a little bit here. What am I given? The um, dimensions of the triangle. Yes, the, I'm talking about over here though. I'm, whenever we're talking about related rates, it's always going to be d something, d something. What what am I given? Dy over dt. D what? Dy over dt. Dy dt. Because it's moving down, so it's moving on the y-axis. Okay, so Ash has just done something. Ash has just said, let's call this dy dt. But that means, Ash, that somewhere in your picture, you need a Y. Because right now in my picture, I don't know what you're talking about when you say Y. What you're talking about, and I know this because I can tell, you're talking about that, dis that distance from there to there. You're calling that Y. Okay, so Ash just decided to call this distance from the top of the ladder to the ground Y. And because Ash has, Ash has called um, that Y, now Ash can say, the rate at which y is changing with respect to time is the 0.5 feet per second. Understand? Has everyone got that? Okay, there's one key thing though. Is y growing or shrinking? 
shrinking. It's shrinking. Shrink. So this rate of change must be negative. Because Y is getting smaller, isn't it? As time goes on, Y is shrinking. So it's coming down the wall, Y shrinks. So the rate of change of Y is a negative 0.5 feet per second. How is that? I mean, this is perfect. This is exactly, remember, look at this step right here. Draw a picture of the scenario in the general situation. Letting variables be variables and constants be constants. In other words, assign variables if you need to. If you need to insert something in there so you can relate it to the D whatever, D whatever, do it, okay? But if it's fixed, make it a constant. Don't ever, don't ever call this 20 like H for hypotenuse. Don't, because it's fixed, okay? It's fixed, that 20 is never changing. What do you want? What do you want? The other point rate change. You wanna know the rate at which the other point's moving, right? So you want D what, D what? X over DT. The X. DX. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. You're talking about X. I don't know what X. What do you? There's no X on your picture. Well, yeah. Now there is. I'm going to call that distance from here to your X. Right. And that's what we want to know. We have assigned a variable to the length of the side of that triangle, basically, that is going to allow me to talk about how fast it's changing. Now, at what moment do you want to know this? At what moment do you want to know how fast X is changing? When, when y, uh, y is three feet from the When ground. Y is three. When the top of the ladder is three feet from the bottom means exactly when this Y value reaches three. Perfect. You have to say Y equals three. You can't just say at three. Because then at three, three what? what? What's three? X, Y, what? What are you talking about? I need to know exactly what you're talking about. Is this making sense? Connect them, connect the two variables together. Any equation you can think of that will connect X and Y together. Off of your, you have to be looking at your general picture. You cannot look anywhere else. You have to look here. Can you think of any equation that would connect X and Y together? The slope equation. Slope, uh, rise over run. Like, is that what you mean? No, like the Y minus y2 i don't know Maybe well I'm slope would slope it would we would definitely have slope but but then we would have to write this equation like slope m equals uh, y over x that is true the slope of that line connecting those two points is y over x but the problem with doing that is now you have an m like what slope if you take the derivative of that you're going to get a dm dt and okay. we don't know what dm dt is isn't it the surface area formula for a triangle? The area formula for a triangle? Oh, no. What's Okay, so what would the area be? It's one half base times one height? Half BH. <laughs> okay. You know the base is X and the height is Y, mm -hmm. right? So could we use this? Could we use this formula? Yes or no? What do y'all think? It has X and Y in it, right? But what else does it have in it? A. A. And so when you differentiate it, you're going to get a DADT. Do you have any information about DADT? No. So even though I agree this is an equation that connects X and Y together, it's not ideal because we know nothing about DADT. And it's Pythagorean. Pythagorean. What would Pythagorean tell us? What's the Pythagorean equation for this? X squared plus Y squared equals 20. Squared, right? Yes, yeah, sorry. X squared plus Y squared is 20 squared. X squared plus Y squared equals 20 squared. That's Pythagorean, right? Oh, I like that. It only has X's and Y's. So I'm going to differentiate. I'm going to get a DX DT. I'm going to get a DY DT, but I'm not going to have any other extraneous crap that's going to be something I don't know, right? I like that. Let's do that one. That's the one, okay? x squared plus y squared 
equals 20 squared, which is 400. Is that all right if I just do that? Bam, we're in business. Let's differentiate it. With respect to time on the left side. Equals, differentiate it with respect to time on the right side. How about the right side? Isn't the right side the easy one? What's the derivative of a constant by itself? Zero, right? If it's a constant by itself, the derivative is zero. So this is zero. All right. We have two, we have two terms here separated by addition. We can differentiate them individually. The derivative of x squared is? 2x um, dx dt. Dx dt chain rule, right? That dx dt pops out. After you bring the two down, x to the first power, then you have to take derivative of x itself, which is dx dt. And then plus, now we do the other one, 2y. But again, chain rule, dy dt. You don't want to admit it, but this is almost kind of exciting, isn't it? I still get excited. I think I'll stop doing this when I don't get excited anymore. I have friends and stuff that ask me like, don't you kind of get bored like 20 years of teaching the same class over and over? I always say, if I had to teach this over and over to the same people over and over, yes. But it's, it's about you, right? It's about you. It's about me trying to help you see this. I still think this is beautiful. And every time I have an opportunity to see a couple of students kind of like eyes light up a little bit like, wow, this is pretty like impressive what you can do with this. That That's enough for me, you know? So... And it never gets old for me. All right, I'm looking at this equation and I'm saying, okay, can I handle everything that's here, right? Am I happy to see things or not? Well, let's see. Uh, let me start with the things I know. I know the y equals three, right? I know that at the instant in time, uh, the dx dt I'm happy because that's what I'm looking for. The dy dt, well, I'm given that is negative point, uh, 0.5. The only thing I'm unsure about is this one here. I don't know what X is at the instant in time, but remember earlier we said that we could find this side if we needed to? We could, that's X, right? But I can find it. I can find it. I, I know that X squared plus three squared must equal 20 squared. Using the good old Pythagorean again, I can get it. So that means X squared must equal uh, 400, take away nine. So I just, I just squared the three, made it nine, brought it to the other side. What is that? 391. Which means X is the square root of 391. I'm going to leave it as square root of 391. I'm not going to get a decimal yet. I'll do it in a minute. So I'm, I'm good to go. I think, yeah, got the, I got X now. Just plug everything in now. Two times X, which is square root of 391, times dx dt is what I'm looking for. So I'm going to leave it dx dt, uh, plus two times y, y was three. And then dy dt is the negative 0.5, and then equals zero. Just plugging everything in there. All right, so we have two square root of 391 times dx dt equals, let me see, I think over here I get negative three, oops, not equals, minus three is what I get here, because this is six and then this is negative 0.5 times six is negative three. Um, so it becomes minus three equals zero. I'm solving for dx dt, so I'm going to Add three to both sides. And finally, I will divide both sides by 
two square roots of 391. So that was just algebra moving uh, these around. Yes. I mean, you multiplying the the three and two with the minus five. Oh, 0.5. Yeah, I see. Point, yeah, it's negative 0.5. So it's it's half of six, but negative, so minus three. Okay, that's my answer. That's my exact answer. Now, if I want an approximate decimal answer, I'd get on my calculator and figure out what this is. So let me do that. Uh, three divided by two times the square root of 391. I'm getting approximately 0 0.076. I'll round it there, dx dt. So dx dt is approximately 0 0.076. What are my units? X and time. So X, X in the problem is, is the distance, right? And that distance we're measuring in what? Feet. feet. So this is gonna be feet and time here was measured in seconds again, right? I think this problem is also seconds. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there we go. As this ladder slides down the wall and the tip of the ladder comes down at three feet per second. Wait, no. Half, sorry, the ladder comes down the wall at half a foot a second. At the instant the ladder is three feet from hitting the ground, that bottom corner will be moving away from the wall at 0 0.076 feet per second. Not very fast, right? Not very fast at all. Considering that it's coming down at point five feet, half a foot a second. It's not moving away at half a foot a second at that instant. Okay. That one only took us 20 something minutes. Maybe we can squeeze one more in, maybe. Sir, I have a question for the other one. So that solution is not the constant of the X uh, rate, right? It's not constant. It's not, yeah, it's not constant because again, if you go to the animation, when this comes down, let me slow it down a little bit. It was slowing down. It slows down in the in the very beginning. Okay. Right. In the very beginning, notice how come on, get back here. In the very beginning, watch how fast this point moves away. And then it starts to slow down. Right. So we if we were to be asked. Now you're asking a really this, I always hesitate from, from going here, but <clears throat> you've asked a question. So I'm going to, I want, I want to take this real quick. This to me is the master formula. Okay. This right here, when we took our derivative, because now with this formula, I can do anything at any point in time. So remember, we were just doing the ladder came down and we were saying, oh, the ladder's three here, that's 20, and then this is X, right? But what if I wanted to look at it at a different point in time when it was like maybe like 20 here and maybe this side was, was 19. So when it first started falling, right? I could use this formula, right? I could do, I have a triangle looks like this now, 20, 19, there's X. Let me solve for X, X squared plus 19 squared equals 20 squared. Let me just get that real quick. 100 minus 19 squared. This would be 6.245, okay? So with this master formula, now what I could do is I could say, all right, make that two. X here is 6.245 dx dt plus two, this time y is 19, and then dy dt is negative uh, 0.5 still. So do you see that I can solve for dx dt again? But it's a different scenario now. What's even better is this, watch. If I solve this, let me solve this equation for dx dt without plugging anything in. This, this to me is the mind blower if you, if you can follow this. Okay, so all I did was I moved this algebraically to the other side of the equation. 
Okay, I move that over. Now I'm going to divide through by 2x. Okay. I'm going to cancel these twos. We are told that this is fixed, right? This is negative 0.5. So if you look at this, the only thing controlling the rate of change of X, how fast that bottom is moving, is the Y value and the X value. So see if you can wrap your head around this. As the ladder comes down the wall, what's happening to Y? Getting bigger or smaller? Smaller. Okay, what's happening to X? Bigger. Bigger. So let me ask you, if I take a number here and I let it get smaller, and take a number here and let it get bigger, what's gonna to happen to this fraction, bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller, right? If I take Y and I let it get small, and at the same time, let the denominator get big, that fraction gets small, which means that as the ladder comes down, DX, DT gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Another way you can look at it is if Y is big, right? If Y is really big, like let's say Y is almost 20, if the ladder's almost vertical, then X would have to be what? Really small, small right? So if you have a big Y and a small X, that fraction is big, which means that the rate that X is changing is fast. If you follow that, you follow it, don't worry about it, okay? It's, I need to move on. I'll let you read. We are assuming that the earth is flat here, okay? Flat enough that we can assume the ground is flat. Don't think about like the curvature of the earth here. I'm not going to show you an animation for this yet. I just want to see if you can maybe get a picture drawn. We'll go one more minute.
Shall we talk? All right, so here's my picture. <clears throat> I'm gonna draw the one at the instant in time. I've got a radar station on the ground. My little, that's my little radar. <laughs> Sorry, y'all can hear. So I told y'all one of my dogs passed away, right? The other dog <laughs> had had like major dental surgery yesterday and he's like all drugged up and he's coughing. Chill out, dude. Okay, sorry about that. All right, there's my radar station. Don't be intimidated by my artistic abilities here, okay? Just, I've been doing this for a long time. So if your radar station doesn't look as good as mine, don't worry about it. Just put a point on the ground. Wait till you see my plane, okay? So I've got a plane flying overhead. That's years of practice, okay? Years of practice. Here's my plane. And what I do know is that this plane is two miles high and that's not gonna change because it says it's flying horizontally. So I know the distance from here to here is two miles. I'm gonna put two MI, two miles. And what we're interested in here <clears throat> is trying to figure out at the moment the plane is six miles from the radar station, how fast the distance between them is changing. Now there's something kind of ambiguous here, the distance between them. What I mean by that and what we mean by this is the straight line distance between them. So if you were to connect a line from the plane to the radar station, we're interested at how fast these, that green line is kind of coming together at exactly the instant that that's six miles. We are not talking about this distance from here to here being six miles. Students will confuse that. It's not this bottom distance. It's not like the projection of the shadow straight down and then over. It's, it's the straight line distance between the two. Is that a pretty decent picture of the, the instant in time? Yeah. Okay, now here's my general picture. I've got my radar station. All right. I've got my plane that's flying. Can anyone tell what kind of plane that is I drew? It's not that good, huh? It's a T-38. You should know that. All right, so in my general picture, this is still two miles. That doesn't change, right? But the distance between them, that is changing, right? That is actually like shrinking as the plane gets closer. That is shrinking, isn't it? I'm gonna call that H. It just seems natural for me to think of that as a hypotenuse. I almost see a triangle right now, right? You could call it any letter you want. I'm calling it H. I would avoid, the one letter I would avoid using is, is D, little d because you're gonna be doing D something, D, D something DT. And it's just weird if you have D, 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 T, just, it's just odd. So, all right, that's my, my picture. Let me see, let me add one more thing. I do know that this plane is flying this direction horizontally, and they gave me the speed of that plane at 600 miles per hour, right? Let's see if I can't get what I'm given and what I want here. D something, D something, D something, D something at some specific point. So who wants to help me on this? <clears throat> you don't have to go in order, whatever order you want here. I don't care. Uh, we're given uh, DY, which is uh, two miles. <laughs> D, Y, D, T. Okay, so let me ask you, Kevin, is, no? is the two miles changing ever? No. Oh, no, sorry. right? So D, Y, D, T. So I think what you're doing is you're trying to call this distance from here to here. You're trying to call that Y. But the thing is, it's Y is not changing, right? 
it's fixed it too. So let's not, let's not assign a variable to it because that's just going to complicate things. It's never actually a variable, right? Oh, so we're going to, so instead of dy and dx, like the last one, it would more be like dh and dx. Okay. Okay. Good. So we're given what, or do you want to say what you want? I don't care what you, what you do. Uh, we're given the distance from the altitude the plane has from the ground and the initial distance it's from, from the, the radar that you drew. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things we were given and the right. speed at which the planning is going. Kevin, did you just say speed? Yes. And isn't speed a derivative? Yes. OK, so it's the rate of change of something. Yes. So in our picture, it's the rate of change of what? What variable is changing at 600 miles per hour? It's not the altitude, right? And it's not h either, because h is this distance. 600 is how fast something is changing. But Kevin, you don't have any variable on here that, that signifies what it is. You see that? Uh, yeah. So you, you need to call it something, right? Yes. What though? Um, X. OK. So where's X on this picture? At the bottom. At the bottom. OK, this is the, this is the hardest part of the problem, is to realize that if you were to connect straight down right triangle over like this, that if we call this X, right, then imagine this point on the top of this where the plane is. If you were to project that point straight down, then as the plane moves at 600 miles per hour, doesn't this point on the ground move at 600 miles per hour? So Kevin, good, DX, DT is actually moving at what rate? How fast is X changing? I couldn't hear you for oh. about like approximately whatever you were saying. It did not okay. come through. It just sounded like Bumblebee from Transformers. So I'm sorry. Okay. So you are calling this distance from here to here X, which I agree with. I'm asking you how fast is X changing? What's the rate of change of X with respect to time? Uh, 600 miles per hour. 600. Growing or shrinking? Shrinking. Shrinking. So I need to put here negative 600 miles per hour. Everyone got that? Now we want to know what? <clears throat> um, wh whoever, I'm Kevin, you've done great. What do we want to know? DHDT. DHDT. The HDT, now here we labeled H earlier just because I said, hey, I think this is gonna be important, right? The distance between these two. I wanna know how fast that H is changing with respect to time. And I want it at what moment? At what moment do I wanna know this? H equals six. Exactly, at this instant when this distance here to here is six and that's, that's what H is, right? So at H equals six. Okay. Anybody have an idea of what equation we can use to connect these two variables together? Working off this picture? Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean, same one as last one. Okay. I'm gonna leave that to you. Okay, I'm gonna leave that to you. And I'm gonna ask you to try and consider, okay, so do that on your own and we'll come back and we'll see what y'all got on it, okay? Because the setup, the rest of it is just set up the equation, implicit differentiation, plug in. You'll probably need to know what X is, which you can get X on this picture, right? You can get X, check, because you have a right triangle here, okay? As a challenge problem to you, there's, this isn't extra credit or bonus, just really this is just for your own. We're going to talk about this problem next time is this one, which is the same problem we just did. But read that. Plane is flying horizontally at an altitude of two miles and speed of 600 miles per hour. Same plane, okay? The plane is headed directly over a radar uh, over a ground-based radar station. At the moment, the plane is six miles from the radar. So this is the same problem, yes, so far? Look what it's asking for, though. 
how fast is the angle of the tracking radar changing? So you have to imagine that as the plane flies over, well, I'm gonna show you the animation. Let me show you the first animation. This was the, this is the problem that we just set up and we didn't finish. The plane was going overhead, okay? The plane was going overhead and we wanted to go and look at a specific instant in time, right? Oh, I have to stop it. Right here at this instant, when this is six, we wanted to know how fast that red line between the two is shrinking. Okay, that's the question that you're gonna tr go and try and figure out, you know, we set it up. That's different from this problem because here we're not interested in the line connecting the two. Here, if you're looking at the plane flying overhead, but think about the radar is almost like somebody's head on a swivel. We're trying to figure out at a specific point in time how fast that radar is turning to keep up with tracking the plane. That makes sense? We're looking for the rate of change of the angle, not the rate of change of the hypotenuse. Maybe you can set that one up. Something for you to play with. As far as homework, look, there's nothing, there's nothing that I haven't um, shown you in terms of like the general template of how you do things, drawing pictures, getting the equation, differentiating. I haven't, I've covered all, right? There's, there's no more like theoretical stuff to cover. Now it's just a matter of if someone gives you a problem, can you like, do it or not, right? So I would say try and do as much as the, of the homework as you possibly can, but also keep in mind that we are gonna spend another day on this. So if you get to a problem where you're like, really just not, I'm not sure, just move on to the next one. Maybe the next one will make more sense to you. Um, the homework assignment for this is right here, all these problems here. So just, you know, kind of, go through them, take a look at them, pick and choose. Some of them are weird. Don't expect that they're going to look anything like what we've done. All right. Some of them might, some of them might not. So, all right. Um, I wanted to mention, we only have a minute left. Um, I think I may have said this before. On your next e exam, this stuff will be there, right? But what I normally do is I give students like a couple of problems to choose from. So maybe I give you like three problems, let you do two of them, or I give you maybe four problems, let you do two of them. In other words, I give you a variety. So if you feel like you read one, you're like, oh, I have no idea how to do that. Hopefully one of the other ones will, will kind of like make a little more sense to you. Because I realize it's really hard to be learning this stuff and then be so good that you can just like, you know, do any, do any related right problem, right? So I try and give you a little bit of variety. And uh, you know, I think that that will be helpful <clears throat> to you on the next exam. So just be aware of that. All right. Just um, y'all can go, but my office hours today, I'll be in my office hours, but I may not be at home. My daughter has a, has a presentation thing tonight that I need to be at. So um, I'm gonna be like on the road doing different things. I won't be in the middle of the, Thing. It doesn't start till 5.30, but I may not be able to write on my screen as easily. So I might have to just kind of talk you through something if you're having a question. So just, just so you know. That's okay, just thank you. Good luck right. with you. All right, yeah. you have a good day. Thank you, have a good day. Yep. Uh, professor, for yes. the, on the exams, uh, would we, if we had related rates questions, um, would we keep a single copy of the template or would we be able to have multiple copies of the template and use the template and submit the template or would you rather? Okay. Yeah, you print out like, you know, five of them or something or hopefully you have a printer, right? Yeah. <laughs> have a couple of copies and, and then you just submit whatever you, whatever you do, just submit it. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Yep. Right. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So I have like the, I add the comment on the quiz of, quiz number four, and I also had the comment on the exam two. And on the last two homework we did, I think you graded before I submit mine because I told you I'm gonna submit in the weekend. 
Okay, so you left comments on those. I'll go. I'll go check them out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Nico. Um, sir, piggybacking off of what I believe Robert Delgado said, can we do all the homework problems on that related? Place? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, it's there for you as a guide, you know. So just keep in mind that everything is going to fit perfectly into this template. It's, you know, this is a this is just to kind of get us thinking the right way, approaching these things in a kind of a, a general sense. But you know, there's some problems that may that the picture there may not be a picture. You know, it may not be something that is easy to draw. Right. You know, so, but yeah, you, you can use the template for all your homework problems for each one. Thank you. I hope you feel better, sir. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. I'm better. I just talking for four hours today is kind of taking its toll. So. Oh, also, uh, I didn't want to bother you, but happy belated pie day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was talking to my daughter about that. 